Asineth Ducat was an eight-year-old girl living with her parents in Upper Arlington, Ohio. She was a third grader at Barrington Elementary School. Nicknamed Sini, she was described as friendly but shy by her friends and family. Asineth was looking forward to summer vacation, which was only a week away. On June 3rd, 1980, Asineth, along with her class, were held 10 minutes after school in order to discipline the students for talking during a lesson. At around 3.10 p.m., Asineth left her school alone to walk to her home, which was about one mile away. Asineth had walked this route many times. She would walk from Barrington Road to Waltham Road and then turn towards Malvern Road. She was last seen by her two classmates walking at 3.20 p.m. on Waltham Road. She never arrived home. When she failed to arrive back at her house, her parents contacted Asenath's teacher, but her teacher said that she'd left school about an hour prior. Her parents knew something was wrong and immediately notified police at around 4.30 p.m. A widespread search ensued for the missing girl. At approximately 7.30 p.m. the same night, a police officer found her body in a drainage ditch near the corner of Riverside Drive and Waltham Road, just a block away from her home. She had been strangled, killed by blunt force trauma to the head by a 20-pound rock found at the crime scene. An autopsy later revealed that she had been sexually assaulted. Less than a month before Asenath's death, on May 7, 1980, at around 3.30 p.m., Another girl from Tremont Elementary School was attacked while walking home from school. The girl was walking with her classmate when they were followed by a man on a red bicycle. The girls would eventually split up, and while cutting through a yard to reach Riverside Drive, the victim was grabbed from behind. When she tried to scream, the man choked her and left her unconscious. The attacker then fled the scene for unknown reasons. Her clothing had been disturbed when she regained consciousness and that she had been moved several feet away from the scene of the attack to a more secluded area. The victim did not see the face of the attacker as she was attacked from behind. A witness described the man on the red bike to be between the ages of 15 and 20 years old, thin, with straight black hair and an olive complexion. The red 10-speed bicycle that the would-be killer had ridden had no fenders and three reflectors, an orange one on the front wheel, a red one on the rear wheel, and another hanging from the back seat. Police believe that the same man who was responsible for Asenath's murder was responsible for the prior attack, as they both occurred at the same time of day and in the same area, and both attacks were sexually motivated. During their questioning, a witness reported to have seen a clean-cut man in a white t-shirt carrying a large object in both hands on the day that Asenath was murdered. The witness also reported to have seen a red bicycle parked nearby. Another witness helped police make a composite sketch of the killer. Despite this, no leads could be found. On that day, the weather was sunny and warm, and while many people were out and about, no one saw anything. Asenath was killed in an open area next to First Community Village, a retirement home for the elderly, but they did not see or hear anything either. Based on this, police theorized that Asenath was abducted and taken someplace else, raped and killed, and then dumped in the ditch. Over the years, police would receive several tips and would interview hundreds of suspects, but to no avail. The case would eventually grow cold. Asenath's murder led to the creation of the community-based group The Long Walk Home, the Asenath Ducat Project, consisting of local kids who remembered Asenath's murder. The group regularly personally investigated Asenath's case and helped police in solving it. On August 11, 2022, the Upper Arlington Police Division announced that they had finally solved the case. They named Brent L. Strutner as the person responsible for Asenath's murder. Strutner was 20 years old at the time of Asenath's murder and lived locally. He graduated from Upper Arlington High School in 1979. He would go on to commit suicide in Columbus, Ohio when he was 24 years old in 1984. Investigators say Strutner had been a suspect in the case for quite a while, but they did not have sufficient evidence to name him. 
In 2008, police sent DNA found at the crime scene for DNA testing at the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Soon, the DNA profile created proved to match Brent Strutner. However, even though police had linked Strutner to the crime more than a decade prior, they did not want to release information until they were absolutely sure. Police Sergeant Brian McKean said, quote, We wanted to make sure all the pieces and parts were tied together before we released anything. Strutner was a suspect long before we had the ability to identify him. Detectives re-examined all the evidence in the case and tried to figure out if Strutner had acted alone or if he had an accomplice. One of Strutner's associates, Robert, also known as Chris Winchester, had been attacking young women in Columbus and the Ohio State University area at the time of Asenath's murder, including an attempted abduction of a young girl on Henderson Road, only months after the murder. Winchester was later found guilty and served prison time for that particular crime on Henderson Road. Winchester was investigated for Asenath's murder, but the police could not find sufficient evidence to link him to the crime. Police have re-examined every piece of evidence found at the crime scene, but no additional physical artifacts suggested that another person was involved. The case was closed after 42 years. However, members of the group The Long Walk Home believe that the case is far from closed. The advocacy group released a statement on the state of the case and its developments. Quote, we applaud the countless hours and hard work that led to the confirmation of Brett Strutner's involvement in the crime. However, after viewing the totality of the evidence, it is reasonable to conclude Brett Strutner did not act alone. Our mission will continue based on that belief, and as long as the Ducat family and our community continue to support our efforts to bring all involved to justice. On February 13th, 2017, best friends Abigail Williams, 13, and Liberty German, 14, planned to go hiking near the beautiful area of Monon High Bridge Trail, east of their small town of Delphi, Indiana. The day before, Abigail had a sleepover at Liberty's home. Liberty was in the primary care of her grandparents, Mike and Becky Patty. Since school had been closed that Monday, February 13th, the two friends had asked Liberty's grandmother if they could go hiking. The girls were granted permission under the condition that they secured a ride to get there and back. Liberty's older sister, Kelsey German, dropped the two off on her way back to work at 1.30 p.m., and the girls arranged to be picked up by Liberty's father, Derek German, after he ran several errands, which would take two hours. At 2.07 p.m., Liberty decided to begin to record their adventure. They took some photos and uploaded a picture to Snapchat of Abigail, smiling as she crossed the abandoned Monon High Bridge. At 3.11 p.m., Derek texted Liberty to let them know to start heading back to their meeting point in order to be picked up. Upon his arrival at 3.14, Derek was dismayed to see that the girls were nowhere to be found. He proceeded to text and to call Liberty numerous times, but received no reply. Derek, now worried, decided to walk the trail to search for the girls. Fifteen minutes later, without any luck, he called Liberty's grandmother, Becky, letting her know that the girls were missing. The family then searched for the girls on the trail for about an hour, but found no trace of them. As it was starting to become dark outside, the family officially reported the girls missing to the police shortly after 5 p.m. By 6 p.m., a massive search was launched. Authorities and over 100 local residents searched the trail that night. The following day, on February 14th, at around 12 p.m., a volunteer searcher stumbled upon the bodies of Abigail and Liberty near Deer Creek, about a half a mile away from the bridge that they were last pictured on. Authorities have not released how the girls have been murdered, nor if they were sexually assaulted, but they did release two compelling images of a prime suspect who they believe may have been the person responsible for the girl's murder. The picture that was released to the public had been bravely captured by Liberty German as she was recording Abigail during their hike. The suspect appeared to be a middle-aged Caucasian male wearing a windbreaker or some type of coat, denim blue jeans, a brown hat, brown shoes or boots, and a brown undergarment, which may be clothing or a fanny pack. Three days later, on February 22, 2017, another clue was made public 
when police unveiled a three-second audio clip of a male saying, quote, down the hill. This was recorded from Liberty's phone. Authorities stated that the audio recording started off as, quote, normal girl stuff, talking and laughing. But when they saw the man on the bridge, the audio captured the girls becoming nervous and worried. It is believed that the girls initially saw the man while entering the trail and forgot about him by the time that they walked the bridge. When the man appeared again on the bridge, the girls may have sensed an impending danger. At one point, Liberty may have decided to click the picture of the suspect and conceal her phone while doing so at her side in her successful attempt to capture the suspect on tape. It is believed that the suspect was unaware of the phone as it was recovered at the crime scene. A hill is located next to the bridge, which is likely what the suspect is referring to in the audio tapes when he says, quote, down the hill. The bodies of the young teens were found across the very shallow creek which flows at the bottom of the hill. It is unclear but theorized that, given the shallowness of the water, the girls crossed over the creek and were murdered on the other side. Other theories postulate that the girls had already been murdered and were dragged or carried across the shallow water. In July of 2017, a witness came forward and reported that they had seen the suspect in the area around the same time the girls had been murdered. A composite sketch was created and released, and police stated that the suspect had reddish brown hair, stood between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 10, and weighed between 180 and 220 pounds. The eyewitness was uncertain of the suspect's exact eye color, but is confident that they were not blue. In September of 2017, a possible suspect was identified and Daniel J. Nations was arrested at a traffic stop in Colorado. Nations, a registered sex offender in Indiana, was driving a car with expired Indiana license plates at the time of his arrest. Nations was arrested in Woodland Park for threatening people with a hatchet on Monument Hiking Trail. A bicyclist was also fatally shot on that trail around the same time Nations was allegedly threatening people. In his car, a red Chevy Prism, there was a hatchet and a 22 caliber rifle. Nations had a lengthy criminal record, including domestic violence, possession of marijuana, driving with a suspended license, failure to appear in court, and pleasuring himself in a woman's restroom at a gas station. Although he was a person of interest in the case, police eventually ruled him out as the killer. Since February 14th, 2017, the day after the girls were murdered, Nations, a registered homeless sex offender, was present for his weekly checkup with authorities and had been consistently attending in the time prior. Nations was sentenced to three years probation on January 5, 2018 for the charge of threatening hikers in Colorado. In more recent years, police have funneled millions of dollars into pursuing various leads, sometimes local and sometimes far-flung. And it could be these excess funds spent, which make those close to the case angry that the true killer was under their noses the entire time, working in the very area the girls went missing at a local CVS. Unbeknownst to the public, a spent but unused bullet casing was found in between the bodies of Abby and Libby. This can happen when the gun is cocked and then uncocked and then cocked again. The spent shell casing is dispensed from the gun, although the bullet is still encased. When the shell casing is ejected from the gun, it leaves specific trace scratches and indentations, which can be traced back to the gun from which it was ejected. It is theorized that the killer cocked the gun and used it as a threat, possibly by putting it towards the head of one of the victims or another instantly fatal zone. And in doing so, this may have motivated the victims through fear of their lives to do what the killer was asking. At some point in the attack, the killer must have disengaged the gun, but later would go on to rack it again, most likely to continue those same scare tactics. It is in this subsequent engagement of the gun that the unshot bullet would have been released. The bullet was later traced to a gun registered to Richard Matthew Allen, a resident of Delphi and a husband and father. Also known as Ricky or Rick Allen, the 50-year-old lived only five minutes from the murder scene. Allen admitted that the gun was his, that he had purchased it in 2001, and that it had been in his possession the entire time. Allen admitted this information freely, 
possibly without realizing that there was evidence left at the crime scene. After he admitted that the gun had not left his possession, nor had it been borrowed by a friend, he was arrested. Later, it was revealed that he had admitted to a park ranger in the initial investigation that he had been in that area. The probable cause affidavit, released a few days after Allen's arrest, stated that there was further footage that police have not released that ties Allen to the crime. Those working the case first spoke with Allen in 2017, claims the affidavit, but Allen may not have been seen as a suspect until more recently due to a clerical error in the tips. But in a later interview, the FBI denies that such a clerical error has occurred and states that all proper protocols were followed and categorizations and filing about the tip about Richard Allen, which was originally received early on in the investigation, was properly handled. Libby's grandmother recalls that Richard Allen, who sometimes worked the photo booth at CVS, printed photos of the girls to be used at their funeral free of charge. Initially, the girls' families looked upon Richard's small act of generosity as evidence of the communal support shown for their daughters. It was only after his arrest that the true, sinister meaning was uncovered. Not only does the shell casing tie Richard to the crime scene, but also Richard reported that he wore the same clothes as in the Snapchat video segments, which the public studied for years to no avail. Richard admits to being on that trail that day, saying that he arrived sometime around 1.30. Around that same time, at 1.26 p.m. that day, witnesses, referred to simply as juveniles, were in the same area, taking pictures, and they saw the same man, later shown in the snapshot footage. It is assumed, based on the geography of the area, that it would take Alan around 10 minutes to walk from the entrance of the park to the bridge. At 1.49 p.m., Abby and Libby were dropped off at that entrance, across from Mears Farm. Shortly before that time, an adult witness, labeled adult witness number one, traveled to the bridge and saw the man, later identified as Richard Allen, standing on the first platform. Roughly five minutes after seeing the man, the same adult witness would turn around and, while walking halfway between the bridge and the parking lot area, see Libby and Abby approaching the bridge. At 2.05 p.m., Libby would upload a picture to Snapchat. At 2.07 p.m., Libby would upload a picture of Abby walking on the bridge. The girls first encountered the man, who is now supposed to be Richard Allen, at 2.13 p.m. This is documented in Libby's video, which astutely shows Abby walking the southeast bridge with the man who they believe is Richard following behind her. As the man approaches one of the girls, she says gun under her breath, as documented on the Snapchat video. Shortly after, the man in the video orders the teenagers to go down the hill, as shown in the Snapchat video released to the media. The girls, now under duress, walked down the hill and the video ends. The suspect, in addition to admitting that he was there, claims to have left the park at around 3.30 p.m., according to the probable cause affidavit. At 3.57 p.m., a separate adult witness observes a male subject, muddy and bloodied, walking on the north side of 300 North Way from the Monon Highway Bridge. Law enforcement has recovered DNA from the crime scene. Whether law enforcement is sure that DNA that they have is definitively the offenders is unknown at this time. A preliminary hearing was held on November 22, 2022, and the judge has scheduled a jury trial to start March 20, 2023. Diane Cusick was a 23-year-old woman living with her parents in Nassau County, New York. She was separated from her husband and had moved in with her parents. She had a three-year-old daughter from her prior marriage and had been working as a dance instructor. On February 15, 1968, Diane finished her job at a children's dance school and called her parents to tell them that she was going to the mall to purchase shoes. However, she never returned home. That night, when Diane failed to return to the house, her parents went out to look for her. They found her car, a 1961 Plymouth Valiant, in the parking lot of the Green Acres Mall in Valley Stream, New York. They opened the car door to find a horrifying sight. Their daughter was laying in the back seat of the car, dead. Her face was bloodied and she had a two-inch piece of tape around her mouth and neck. They immediately notified police. An autopsy determined that she had been beaten in the face and the head. Her cause of death was determined to be strangulation. 
She had defensive wounds on her hands, and police were able to collect DNA evidence at the scene. However, DNA testing did not exist in 1968. Police conducted a massive search of the area and showed Diane's photo to nearly 2,000 people, asking if they could provide any information about her last hours. Police were able to release a description of a suspect seen at a movie theater in the mall shortly before Diane's body was found. Witnesses said that the man was a white male in his late teens or early 20s, with average build. They claim he wore eyeglasses and was at least 5 foot 8 inches tall. Diane's estranged husband was ruled out as a suspect as he had an alibi. He was working his part-time job as a taxi driver at the time of the murder. Police questioned multiple people, but no leads could be found and the case would eventually grow cold. In 2016, the DNA sample found at the crime scene was submitted to a national database, but no match could be found. Then, in 2021, police in Nassau County received a tip that a killer who was responsible for other killings in a suburban county, who was currently locked up in New Jersey, may also be responsible for Diane's murder. Police ran a DNA test again, and this time it matched the convicted serial killer, Richard Cottingham. Cottingham is now 76 years old and serving a life sentence for murdering nearly half a dozen women and girls in New Jersey and New York since the 1960s. He was arrested in 1980 after a motel employee heard the screams of a woman inside his room. Police were called and they found the woman alive but handcuffed and suffering from bite marks and knife wounds. Cottingham would later admit to killing more than 100 women. However, police have officially linked him to about a dozen killings. He was also nicknamed the Torso Killer because he was known for dismembering his victims. Police believe that Cottingham pretended to be a security guard or possibly a police officer and that he accused Diane of stealing. He then asked her to come with him and overpowered her in a secluded area. Cottingham was working as a computer programmer for a health insurance company in New York at the time of the killings. In June of 2022, Cottingham was officially charged with Diane's murder. On December 5, 2022, Cottingham admitted to killing Diane Cusick and four other women decades ago. He was sentenced 25 years to life behind bars for Diane's murder. However, he won't be prosecuted for the four other murders as he is already spending the rest of his life in prison for prior murder convictions. Diane's daughter, Darling Altman, now 58, said during a police conference, quote, I never thought I'd see this day. I'd given up, but all these people got justice for me and my mother. The case was finally solved after 54 years. 